while everybody is joining, I just want to welcome those who are on the webinar. My name is Julie Rizzo. I'm Director of Development and the Charity SEAL Licensing Program at the BBB Wives Giving Alliance. And uh, welcome to our webinar today on maximizing your marketing in a fragmented media environment. Um, this session will be led by Angela Walton of Breakthrough Marketing Consulting. Angela is the founder and president of Breakthrough Marketing Consulting, a 16-year veteran of the consumer marketing industry. Angela has a proven track record of developing strategy, building brands, and creating marketing communications for leading global and national consumer brands. We are also joined today by Therese Kung, Chief Strategy Officer at Harrison Star. Therese is currently the Chief Strategy Officer at Harrison Star, a strategic marketing agency. She has over 20 plus years experience in the pharmaceutical biotech sector, developing long range strategic plans, branding and marketing strategies for multinational clients and small startup firms. She has a particular passion for gaining a more robust understanding of underlying customer needs, motivations, behaviors, strategic customer segmentation, and orchestrating a customer's journey along the marketing funnel, awareness, interest, decision, action, and loyalty. So thank you both for joining us today um, as we welcome our, our participants as they sign in. And um, Angela, do you wanna get us started? Sure, let me share my screen here. First, I'd like to say, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. I just want to say thank you to Julie and the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving a team for inviting Breakthrough and myself to come and share with you today. We're excited to be here this afternoon. We're going to start off just by talking that the role of any marketer is to create the right message and deliver it to the right audience at the right time, really using the most effective channels. However, today's media environment is more fragmented than ever, really making it challenging to effectively identify and engage with your target audience in the most relevant and meaningful ways. So why is that? Today, we're gonna to talk about some of the macro environmental forces that are really impacting consumers and their willingness to give and support nonprofits. Then we're gonna get into just some marketing trends. Um, let's really talk about what's driving the shifts in marketing spending and approaches today. And then we'll end with giving you six strategies to develop your own impactful marketing. So let's get started. As we fully emerge from our pandemic um, experience, we find ourselves really in an ever evolving marketing place as grappling with economic uncertainty, declines in philanthropic giving and a multi-generational donor base. So we're gonna talk about each one of these today. We're all living in this environment of this economic uncertainty. So we're very much familiar with the high inflation, which is really causing negative consumer sentiment and belt tightening, higher interest rates, bank failures, and even corporations are really starting to streamline their sponsorship opportunities. They're under pressure to really make sure that they're being efficient and tightening up their alignment to their own organizational values and motivations. Let's talk a little bit about the declines that we're seeing in philanthropic giving. This is from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. They do a quarterly report, and this is the full year 2022 versus 2021. And you'll see that the giving dollars is down 1.7% in 2022 versus 2021. Donors are down 10% and retention, meaning the owners, donors from the previous year um, that did not come back in 2022 is down 3.5%. So this is the second consecutive year of significant decreases in donor participation. And we're really seeing the decline in terms of the overall dollars being driven by the large donors. Um, and again, this is 2022 data, but we've seen this even this year. Uh, CNBC last week did a poll of millionaires asking them where they plan to cut back due to the high inflation rates. They said 16% of them said in charitable giving. So we can see that some of these trends from even last year are kind of coming forward into this year. And even um, that the things that may have sparked the um, giving like the pandemic or societal issues are not really making people return to giving like they did um, in previous years. Let's talk about news. The good news is that we have a multi-generational donor base and there is a historic wealth transfer that's happening right before our very eyes. So you have donors who are expected to transfer um, their wealth to 
generation X and millennials by 2045, $84 trillion. And actually the impact to nonprofits is expected to be 12 trillion. Um, but these younger donors have their own unique identity with 76% of them saying that they want to have a philanthropic identity that is separate from their family or different from their parents. And this really just pinpoints that they have their own values, motivations, behaviors. For instance, you know, younger audiences are you know, much more likely to share causes that they believe in online and to contribute to crowdfunding campaigns. They're also much more zero targeted in on concrete results. So they want to know your theory for change. They want to go on the on-site visits. They want to see the hard data as to why your program or your organization is effective. And this all leads into them feeling more comfortable to give when they have you know, that trust. And this is where, of course, Wise Giving Alliance can come in as well in just building that trust for them to make that decision for organizations. So, it's been said that if you want to see the future of marketing, that it's more like looking through a kaleidoscope than a telescope, meaning that you have several diverse fragments versus one single perspective. And that's because our marketing environment today includes traditional marketing, digital marketing, and emerging channels. So traditional marketing is everything that does not require, you know, internet for advertising. So that's your TV, your radio, your print, your out of home, your even direct mail. And of course, we're now much more familiar with all the digital marketing tactics, such as websites, social media, email, blogs, apps, mobile, et cetera. And what's coming onto the scene more and more now are podcasts, augmented reality, and virtual reality. And I want to talk a little bit about virtual reality and how some nonprofits are using that. Um, it's been very effective in awareness campaigns. So specifically, um, Alzheimer's organization in the UK developed a virtual reality app to really help give people an idea of an experience of what it's like to have dementia. And this really helped them um, gain awareness and compassion and understanding for their cause and their mission and ultimately helped gain support. Traditional media is still very much relevant and alive. And even though um, you know, we've lived in kind of this digital environment for the last decade, CMOs are now shifting um, from a digital first perspective to more of a hybrid and multi-channel strategy. And that's because although consumers are spending much of their waking hours online, they're also becoming numb to the conventional di digital advertising that they're experiencing. So all the pop-ups and all the, you know, the, the ads before the video that they want to see, you know, they're just really tuning out from all this and it's becoming a very cluttered environment. So you take the cluttered effect and you put on top of that the death of the death third party cookies. And you really see marketers really go back to some of these tried and true tactics for reach. So we know that traditional media is traditionally more um, effective in gaining reach, attention, engagement. It's also more trusted than um, social media advertising. And in terms of um, broadcast TV, there's nothing like, you know, that it's the ideal platform for really delivering those emotional storytelling methods um, that really can draw your audience in. So we even see um, things of changing and shifting in this channel. So traditional TV is now trending towards connected TV or streaming. And we see as viewers go that way, I mean, so do advertisers and organizations. So now uh, organizations like Finecast can enable advertisers to really do precision targeting to viewer segments across on, on demand as well as live stream TV. Um, you also see um, companies like Netflix and Disney Plus offering ad supported packages to those consumers who are no longer willing to pay a premium for those uh, ad free environments. And then you see a little bit of experiment with Walmart and Roku coming together to develop a partnership around leveraging TV streaming for e-commerce shopping opportunities. So a little bit of innovation in this segment. For digital marketing, the effectiveness is also evolving. And so no, nonprofits are definitely reevaluating platforms and content to really respond to this digital decentralization and the cluttered environment. So let's take Twitter, for instance, and we've all kind of seen the turmoil that's happened with that platform since Elon Musk has come aboard. Some people are taking a wait and see approach while others are, you know, no longer um, you know, leveraging this platform. 
And some people are just unwilling to pay the additional fees to get the uh, checkmark badge. For email marketing, it's all about, you know, what are you getting audience, audiences to do after they open the email? So how are you driving them through your marketing funnel? For search, again, we talked about this cookie-less environment and where Google was once dominant because they had so much data. Now you're seeing marketers explore other alternatives like being and just more cost-efficient opportunities. And even TikTok has you know, enhanced their video descriptions to 2,200 characters. So now making their platform much more robust and searchable. And that's really appealing to a younger demographic. One of the biggest shifts that you're seeing is that Facebook, which most nonprofits will say has been their staple in terms of they got the most users there, as well as they post the most content there. But when you ask them about the future for 2023 and beyond, they're really shifting towards Instagram and LinkedIn. And that's because Instagram is really growing. Um, it's growing with a younger audience, and it's actually growing in terms of engagement due to things like reels and things of that nature. And nonprofits like LinkedIn as well, and that's due to their ability to really be able to target um, individuals based on their profession or based upon their professional networks, um, and also have that one-on-one -on -one engagement with thought leaders directly. Oh, let's talk about these emerging channels. So the decentralization of social media platforms um, is really causing marketers also to explore, to test, and learn from new options. There's a steady flow entrance um, into what, what was once tried and true. So for instance, you have T2 coming in trying to dethrone Twitter or Be Real trying to be that more authenticity, you know, authentic version of IG, and you have the you know, emergence of platforms like Meta and Clubhouse. But as marketers, we're all trying to figure out you know, what has peaked and what is permanent. So just taking a test and learn strategy is really important to see what really has staying power. Uh, podcast advertising is really, this is a growing medium and we're actually seeing the advertising dollars grow as well. Versus last year, it was up 81% um, percent in terms of the podcast ad impressions. And we're expecting to see this medium continue to grow. And that's because listeners really trust their podcast host. Um, they're genuinely influenced by their endorsements. And almost half of podcast listeners actually pay attention <laughs> to the podcast advertisements versus other formats. And it's a really effective way to get a really targeted and well-informed, um, well-suited audience to hear your message. You'll also find that user-generated content is going to be more prevalent in the future, especially versus influencer content. Um, again, consumers have started to really uh, move away from influencers and kind of see through and really are gravitating to the authentic appeal of real life people and real life stories. Um, and also it's very efficient and effective. Uh, it's a way to really create a lot of short video content that you can leverage on multiple platforms. And last, but certainly not least, is augmented reality integrations. You're seeing platforms like Snapchat and Facebook They've already added features um, that let you add texts or images onto your real world view. And we know that Google is also looking to add innovation in this space as well. So those are just some things to consider as you put together your marketing mix. So now let's talk about what strategies you can leverage for developing your own impactful marketing. And you really want to start with a customized approach for your organization to really connect with your target audience. And that starts first and foremost with creating a strategic marketing plan. So your first step is to really evaluate organization's priorities. So really identifying the issues that you're looking to solve, and then also defining the metrics or the KPIs that you're looking to impact and defining what success looks like for you. From there, you really want to determine where you are in your customer journey and what tactics are best to really help drive people through your marketing funnel. And that's really going from awareness to trial to ultimately conversion. And Teresa is going to talk about this a little bit later in our talk today, but you're going to hear terms like top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, or bottom of the funnel. And really, those are just different marketing tactics that you use to really go from awareness to interest to conversion. And your ultimate goal is to take your supporters and stakeholders and make them informed, vested, and loyal to your organization. So next, uh, the cost for 
fragmentation is really segmentation and personalization. Um, it's really important for you to cater your marketing approach to the unique needs and goals of each individual segment. Uh, you can segment based upon donor size, based upon attitudes, based upon behaviors, uh, demographics, psychographics, um, but it's really important to cater your message as well as your medium to really what um, is appealing to your target audience. And in addition to that is personalization. It's important to really understand that the Supporters that you're going after, they're consumers and they're consumers in this high tech world. So they have Spotify playlists, they have Amazon carts, you know, they have Netflix accounts and all of those have their specific profiles that are based upon their needs and their interactions and their leveraging past as well as predictive information. And so, you know, these consumers are expecting the same type of experience and interactions from your organization. So it's really important as you develop your marketing to really personalize and segment, to really cater to their interests, their desires, their aspirations, and their communication preferences. So oh, today's consumer wants everything, everywhere, all the time. <laughs> so it's really important for you to have clear, concise, and consistent brand story that's communicated across multiple channels. Um, so the first step, of course, is selecting the right platforms to reach and engage with your target consumer. And once you do that, really evaluating the effectiveness of each channel. So what's the reach? What's the ROI? Uh, what's the frequency? What's the time spent? And what are those metrics that you're really looking to, um, to push the dial on to really achieve success and to you know, engage with your audience? Um, we're also seeing that in this kind of potential recession environment, that leveraging organic campaigns is a great option for nonprofits to consider. So that's really just all of your unpaid tactics um, to really drive traffic to your website. So it's a lot of content marketing, whether it's creating blogs or email campaigns or search engine optimization, um, case studies, a lot of things that really are unpaid that you can leverage in your toolbox. This next one is a big one specifically for medium to small size nonprofits. Some of the larger nonprofits may have already done this, but we find that a lot of times nonprofits um, have data in several different places and the data is not integrated and talking to each other. And so you really want to reinvest in technology that integrates all of your data for your organization, because without that, you're creating a major barrier to developing really more effective marketing communication. So you want hopefully a CRM platform that enables you to really segment by topics, donors, advocates, programs, et cetera. And that will help you have a much more robust marketing plan and strategy. Of course, once you've invested technology, making sure that you're also in your talent to make sure that the staff is properly trained to use the software so that you all can just really make the best of it as an organization. And if you need tech support, just making sure that you have that available as well. Storytelling and video content. Um, just creating a compelling and emotional story around your nonprofit mission, programming, and social impact is critical. So um, sometimes for organizations, especially who've been around a while, it's important to periodically evaluate, you know, has your mission changed? Um, has it evolved? Um, do you need to potentially reshape your brand story to effectively communicate where your organization is today? So that's a good thing to do from time to time. Also, um, in terms of video content, we know that most um, audiences are definitely much more receptive to short video content and nonprofits are typically using this in more of a, you know, interview or one person or one subject format. But we like to encourage nonprofits to, you know, leverage lots of different video formats. So whether it's, you know, behind the scenes videos, show and tell, how we would love to see, you know, more variety in terms of the video content that's being leveraged. And last, but certainly not least, is artificial intelligence and automation. So AI is here to stay and definitely transforming um, marketing and sales as we know it. 
providing just greater efficiency in terms of reach, scalability, um, effectiveness. And it's doing that because this Gen AI technology really enables you to um, analyze large amounts of data and really identify new or additional segments that maybe you didn't know were there. It also enables you to optimize your marketing strategies by doing kind of A-B testing of various campaigns, um, page layouts, uh, headlines, um, and even search, search engine optimization strategies, and definitely even creating personalized um, content or copywriting. So uh, the automation feature is also good for creating workflows that are standard and saving time for your organization. So you'll see when you put all of these six strategies together, it really can give you a more robust and integrated um, campaign, really cut through the clutter and effectively reach your target audience. So with that said, I just wanna say thank you on behalf of Breakthrough Marketing Consulting. Um, our mission is to help nonprofits maximize their potential. So we're here to help you um, really bring your inspirations to life. So let us know. Stop sharing now and kick it back over to Art and Julie. Art, we can't hear you. on mute. Can't hear you. Okay, how about now? There we go. <laughs> well, I wanted to just thank you, Angela, for that very strong presentation giving all of our panelists um, something to respond to. I know Teresa has something she wants to respond to and all of our listeners and viewers, something to really think about and take with them. The slides will be available to uh, those of you who joined the uh, show and we'll get them to you later. So let's jump in right away with Teresa's presentation and she's gonna take a slightly different bent, although it'll be very much aligned with what you just heard from Angela. Therese is gonna talk more about it from the standpoint of an organization trying to work through the many channels that are available. So Therese, jump right in and give us uh, your sense of uh, how okay. organizations can maximize their marketing opportunities in this crazy environment. So thank you, Angela, for setting up this so well for me, because what I'm going to do is dive down a little bit deeper into what Angela talked about um, on her first strategy around strategic marketing planning and uh, the personalization a part of um, the second strategy of segmentation and personalization. And we're going to look at this through the lens of the customer, um, your um, supporters, your constituents. So give me one second to pull up. Um, can you see my screen? We can. Yes. It has a lot of other things on it. So let me just close all up. Great. Um, very happy to be here with you today. And please um, you know, drop your um, questions and comments for Angela and myself in the chat. Uh, I think there is an intercession next week as well on this particular topic. Um, and we can continue the conversation then. Um, so really, uh, you know, the nut, the, 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 the whole story to this, um, you know, marketing, ma maximizing the marketing dollars in this type of environment is really understanding your constituents and um, your supporters. And you have many constituents that you have to pay attention to. I've just listed a bunch here. There may be more depending on, you know, which sector you're in and, and um, uh, who you have to play with. But each of these people and, and um, organizations are different. They have different wants and needs. Um, and you have to talk to them differently. Although your mission and what you do is the same, how you speak to these each of these individuals and each of these um, categories of folks is quite different. So how do we do this? Um, there's a guy named Joe, uh, and he is one of the most creative people in advertising, so say Ad Week in 2015, and he makes a really good point. A good marketing makes the company look smart Great marketing makes the customer feel smart for choosing your product, your services, you know, your um, your purpose. Um, and this is what we're here to do. So how do we do this and how do we make the customer feel smart? Um, we have to understand who they are, where are they on their journey to become, you know, true supporters of your organization's mission? What story do they need to hear to make them? Um, move and act on your behalf? And then fourth, how do we engage them? So I'm going to take each of these questions in turn. 
um, and give you some uh, frameworks to think about um, that maybe you can use right away tomorrow um, to kind of help build your plan. So the first thing, who are they? Um, something to think about, no matter what they do, whether they're in the government, whether they're in the foundations, they're a volunteer or they're an individual donor, think of them as people first. What they do is secondary to who they are. They're human beings. They play in this world like you and I do. They use all the same um, tools and techniques as you do. And um, think about them as people first. How do we do that? We have this nifty little way, we call them personas. You create little um, snippets, um, a biography, so to speak, a profile of who some of your most important categories of uh, supporters are. Here, I've mocked one up for you, um, purely being illustrative around maybe the aspiring influencers who want to work with your organizations um, and um, do some good that way. Um, you can think of them as, you know, there could be a hundred of these folks or it could be 15% of your donor base, whatever it is. Understand, talk to them, record down, you know, who they are in the description, um, you know, how they like to communicate, you know, why they may not be willing to engage with your organization, and what about their lives right now that would make them and drive them towards your organization to working with you, um, either as a big donor, either as a, um, you know, a fundraiser or in whatever capacity um, that they want to, and then, you know, come up with some communication objectives with them. Um, so as you speak with them one-on-one, -on -one, as you create emails targeting them, as you um, do whatever your marketing program is, um, you can have a much more targeted and personal way of reaching them. You know, how do you create these personas? Some organizations do some quick and dirty market research. Other folks, they just notate down based on the conversations, um, observations that you have. But having this all in one place can be um, a lot of help for not only your marketing uh, group, um, your um, you know, a development group, um, your P PR folks that um, may be speaking on your behalf or whoever it is that you're that's working with these folks. So you can create as many of these personas uh, for each one of um, your supporters um, that, you know, you may need. All right. So there's many different ways of doing it. This is one way of doing this. Um, the next question, where are they on their journey? So Another nice little rule that I have is always to respect each of your supporters learning and adoption curve. Everybody is not in the same place in the journey. Um, and what is a journey, you may ask? Um, there are many different ways of depicting a journey. This is one way of doing so. Uh, people can be unaware and then they become aware of your mission. Um, I say trial here, but other people may say interest. Um, this is when they tiptoe and they're starting to um, get involved in some of what um, your organization does. Maybe they make a you know, trial donation or maybe they show up at an event. You know, they're tiptoeing in here. Decision is when they're full on, they've converted, they want to be part of your uh, sphere and uh, they want to get much more actively involved, they're embedded. Um, and then later on, some of those people can become ardent advocates of your organization's mission. So they do much more. Maybe they're huge fundraisers. Maybe they are um, orchestrating programming on your behalf. Maybe maybe they're just a super volunteer, you know, in your organization. But there are different ways to kind of define this depending on your organization's mission and who the um, category of supporters are. But knowing where they are in this journey um, helps you talk to them in a much more personal way so that your messaging is relevant to them, all right? Um, so when you're trying to profile where these people are, what you want to do is understand what's in their head. What are they thinking about when they're in the unaware stage? What are they feeling? What do you, what are they doing usually in these stages? And therefore, given all these things, what do you want to happen to each of these individuals at each of these stages? And how do you then move them through the funnel, so to speak, so that they can get to the next stage, right? Um, there are many different ways to identifying um, where your supporters are in this funnel. 
sometimes you can look at um, you know uh, how actively involved they are with you. Maybe you can even look at how uh, much they look at your materials. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of different ways, and it's all different depending on um, your organization's mission and sector and, and what you do. Um, but it's good to somehow create this uh, profile as well so that everybody in your organization is on the same page. I mocked one up for you just as an illustration for this aspiring influencers that we just talked about in the personas. So let's say I'm an aspiring influencer, but I know nothing about your particular organization. I am in the unaware stage. You know, I am... Um, you know, looking for information, um, trying to find out more. Maybe I was randomly served up um, an email from your organization, and I'm wondering, what is it, right? I'm kind of frustrated, and I'm getting, um, you know, unsolicited emails uh, from somebody, and I just kind of want to unsubscribe. But maybe there is something in your uh, email that kind of piqued me and I want to find more information, right? So then I go to Google, I go to, you know, whatever else I go on um, to kind of figure out um, what your missions organizations are. Some point I say, hmm, it's so interesting what you guys do. I am now much more aware of what your organizations are, uh, mission is. And so uh, I am in this aware stage, but I don't know enough yet. So I'm still talking to people. I'm still looking at your website. I'm still looking at other materials, but I'm paying attention now to your emails and I'm paying attention to the direct mail that I'm getting from you. And I'm opening them up. I'm not throwing them out and um, I'm learning and I wanna do something. So then I'm in a trial stage. So I'm not gonna belabor this conversation, but you can see how the individual changes in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their enthusiasm and their belief in what you guys do, in terms of how they act and how they interact with your organization. And therefore, what you need to do in terms of making sure your supporters are going down this journey has to be different. You know, what you need to do is, as exemplified by what's in the last row needs to be different and needs to be very customized, all right? Key is, no matter where they are, you want to move them along the continuum seamlessly um, and um, not call them out on it, right? So this is one way to kind of think about this. Um, you can create different initiatives and programmings under each of these, you know, personal journeys. You can blow this chart out to even more rows and, um, you know, think about what marketing tactics and programming you, you may want to engage these folks on. It could be quite different for each of these columns. Okay, so then the third question is, what story do they need to hear? We have to be relevant and engaging in order for them to pay attention to us. Why? I'm gonna just rest on this slide for a few minutes. Um, you know, I see myself in some of these adjectives on these, these slides. I'm no different than any of you that's on the call right now or on the panel. Um, we are feeling bombarded and overwhelmed, inundated, and some of us are tuning out. Imagine you have your work email, you have your personal email. I even have a junk personal email that, that I keep a separate account for. There's all these um, solicited and unsolicited um, emails. I'm looking at things on videos. Um, and then my telephone, I get the spam calls all day long as well. You know, how should I tune in um, to what's important? How do I even know what's important, right? So this is about relevance and engaging. So, um, you know, when we talked about um, the funnel just now, we need to map what we want to say, depending on where each of our supporters are along the funnel. Yes, you have some universal messaging that won't change no matter who you're speaking to, no matter where they are in the journey. And you should identify what those messaging are so that everybody is speaking from the same songbook. Uh, but then you may need to identify new messaging, new content that you want to tell certain supporters, depending on where they are in the funnel. Um, something that's relevant to them that would pique their interest and get them to pay attention and do more. All right. So what you say to an investor, um, a, fund, a funder, large corporate funder, or um, to an individual, a donor that maybe have donated one time um, and you want to up their donation or, you know, whether it's a, a volunteer, you know, it's different. 
So this is the point of the slide. Do the exercise and map out your content this way, your messaging this way, so that uh, you have it all in one place and you can pivot quite easily and you can even program it into your automated marketing tools um, to pulse that out. Um, and then the last question is, how do we engage them? We have to meet them where they are. People are looking for information in certain places. And when you're doing that persona profile that we spoke about a couple of minutes ago, there is a little area where we say, you know, like, you know, no takedown, what channels they use, what media they love, um, you know, remember that uh, when you engage them. So depending on where they are in the funnel, there are probably certain channels that are better suited for that part of the funnel than other parts of the funnel. So, you know, broad-based advertisements, um, you know, websites, um, those are great for people who are unaware, who are just um, needing someone to kind of jolt them, um, some place to kind of go there to kind of look for information. And when you're going down to the bottom of the funnel, the tactics are very different. It has to be much more targeted. Uh, it has to be um, much more um, meaningful to where they are in, in the process. So I just put this out there, um, you know, depending on what you want to say and who you want to say it to, you may want to use some of these channels, not necessarily all of them. All right, you have to pick and choose and come up with something that's that's interesting uh, for for your particular supporters. So here they are, four questions. Some of the principles to kind of just remember it by. Uh, we also share some tools with you um, that might be helpful for you to kind of build your marketing plan. Um, and thank you. That's all I have for you. Um, I hope that was helpful and uh, very actionable as well. Well, I think we have some time for Q&A, and I want to kick it off by just going to Angela and asking you, what are you seeing, Angela, with your clients? Where are they, where are they struggling and where are they thriving, so to speak, in this relatively, I guess it shouldn't be new anymore, it's, it's in this newer <laughs> <laughs> media landscape that we're seeing right now, this newer communications landscape with so many different channels. How are your clients faring? Yeah, I think that's really dependent upon the organization and how much you are adapting and leveraging technology because this world and marketing and everything has become so much more influenced by technology. And so if you've taken the time to develop a uh, distribution list, then that opens up many more channels, you know, to you. So most um, organizations, they start with their, you know, um, their email, then their website, and then social media, and they're building upon that. And so those are the top three that organizations are, are leveraging. But from there, you know, it really starts to get into, okay, well, now are your platforms working together? So for instance, your website, are you get able to get leads from that and able to tell, you know, how long people are staying on your site or how far they're drilling down and things of that nature, because you can then have better conversations, um, better messaging, better marketing, to really tap in and, and kind of get them to go further in your organization. So making sure that you're able to communicate and kind of have that integrated data with your donors, with your emails. I think sometimes that's where some of the organizations are struggling because they haven't done that work and kind of adopted things like a Salesforce, for instance, you know, that really allows you to have more robust um, campaigns and leverage data in a much more robust way. So if you can do that, and just continue to build, it just really opens up many more platforms and options for you. Well, let me ask one, oh, go ahead, Therese, sorry. I want, I want to piggyback on what Angela was saying. I totally agree with everything. And I think more and more organizations now, um, they do a lot of experiments and pilots, you know, test. Uh, if I haven't used this particular technique or that particular, you know, type of channel before, let me, let me do a little test run and see what happens. So I get to know how it works, what responses it gives me, whether it's a good um, return on my investment or not. They may test it on a particular uh, audience. They may test it in a particular region. Uh, they may test it for a particular event and certain type of messaging. There's so many Many different ways to kind of run a pilot. But if you don't know, if you haven't worked with a particular tool before, I would say try it out. No harm done, right? Small scale, not a lot of investment. You could learn so much from them. 
Yeah, and that, that leads me to this question I want to ask about how smaller, less resourced organizations can really take advantage of what resources they do have to get the most out of their marketing. Would you say that there are technological tools that might be most valuable to them? Would you say that there are strategies that will yield the most results given their limited resources? You know, we hear this all the time in our sector that large organizations, well, they can act like corporations, you know, they can just mm -hmm. put money into their marketing budgets and reach their <laughs> audiences without too much uh, uh, resistance from, you know, their CFOs. But mm -hmm. if you're a smaller organization and you're trying to do as much as you can with the resources you have programmatically, and now you're trying to market, what are some of the tools or tips that you would recommend to them to make sure that they're putting their resources in the right places to get the best results? I'll start with you again, um, you know, Angela. Sure. You know, that's a great question. I think um, my biggest thing that I would tell marketers is just you have to start. I think the one thing that um, nonprofits do is sometimes they get a little paralyzed. So we don't have the money, so we can't do it. And so the biggest thing that you can do, you know, is is just pick one thing and start. So whether it's, OK, we're going to blog. And that way you're creating content and that you can funnel into your email campaign, but you have to do something. A lot of times um, nonprofits will just only, they won't have evergreen kind of campaigns or advertising. They'll just only come in for a, a fundraiser or for a program. And, you know, you have to really develop a relationship with your audience. So, you know, leveraging the channels that you have, again, that are unpaid, that organic content. So you have your own you know, website, your own social media, those things you don't have to pay for. That's different than paid search or paid search engine, you know, ads and things of that nature. Um, so you can leverage things like create case studies, white papers, all these things are free. That's the organic campaign um, piece that I'm talking about. But a lot of that is, you know, content marketing, user generated content. You know, you have employees, you have um, participants in your programs that you can leverage to tell great stories. And so when you kind of start to just, just start, get started and leverage that, you can put that on your different platforms and build from there. Thank I you. would um, also add um, your the foundational tactics that most not-for-profit use or any organization will use, like your website, um, like um, just uh, you know how you how you um, work with search, etc. Your social media, mm -hmm. um, make sure how you're using that is completely optimized um, so that people get the best experience. Sometimes it's just the basic things that we need to do better um, and optimize it more. Um, spending a little bit more money there in terms of how you um, optimize your search engine results, you know, would be great. Sometimes that use so much more um, a bang for the buck than doing a lot of whiz bang things. And then I tell you another secret, um, secret sauce, you know, your advocates, um, you know, people, you know, Word of mouth is hard, but um, those folks can definitely be put to good use to rally more and to kind of use their network to kind of help you so that um, your uh, constrained funding to uh, invest in some of these marketing opportunities uh, can yield results when, you know, other folks kind of come in and, and help you as well. So um, I think, you know, never underestimate your advocates and, um and, and your influencers in that way um, and the use of social media as well, so. Absolutely, and I wanna add on to that email marketing, you know, you can leverage yes. that. And then even direct mail, believe it or not, has, has um, made a comeback in terms of, it can be a little flyer, but these QR codes, that's data in terms of saying how many times has it, has it been scanned? You know, are people signing up for the workshop? So those are tactics that you can use that don't cost that much money. Yep, measure, measure, measure. That's, that's the most important thing. If you don't measure it, you don't know, and you may be spending money in the wrong places. Um, so. so, Therese, let me ask you about this, um, this journey chart that you had. I really thought that's interesting how people start out with complete unawareness about your organization, and they go to sort of being a champion at the end of the day for your organization. Hopefully, that's where you want to get them to. And there are different strategies and approaches, obviously, throughout that process. Where should organizations be putting their 
time and energy, I guess throughout, right? Because it depends. it's a long-term, you know, you're not going to get a whole lot today from people who don't know anything about you, right? I think but over time, you got to put something into it because you want them to be yeah. Yeah, eventually, right? Let me, um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, I hate when people answer, it depends, but it really does depend. <laughs> if you're new not-for-profit, you just got set up, maybe that you're a year or two years into it, you're probably just trying to get more and more people aware of what you're doing, getting more people involved. So maybe there's a need to concentrate at the top of the funnel and then maybe a little bit in the middle of the funnel to kind of get people involved, right? If you're a not-for-profit that has been around for a while, your mission is clear, people are supporting you, um, maybe it's, you're, you're concentrating in the middle of the funnel. You don't have to put as much work in the top of the funnel. You're trying to get the people who are donors who are volunteers who are activists you know on your behalf to actually do more and do it in a bigger way or a more impactful way maybe what you're trying to do is get more influencers as well more advocates right so i think it all it all depends on where you are in your life cycle um, it could depend on the initiative that you're launching right a new initiative you want to get more people involved um, an initiative that has been running for a while and is taking a different you know turn um, you may want to concentrate in a different part of the funnel. So it all depends. And I think as an organization, when you create your, your um, annual plan, you have to understand where you want to put your dollars. And it's okay to put your dollars in multiple places, mm -hmm. right? But you can't be all thing to all people. Think about it. You have $100. You only have $100 to spend. If you spread it out over those five um, stages, that's 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Well, you're kind of like spreading yourself thin, right? Um, if you put it in three stages, all of a sudden you can do so much more with your marketing dollars, right? It's it's the same as us as consumers, right? I, you know, I'm I'm um, this is not true, but I'm renting a new house. I need furniture. Do I furnish the kitchen, the bedroom, and you know everything at once, or do I buy? Um, do I you know I love to cook, so I'm going to like concentrate all my money in the kitchen first. You know that that's another you know um, example to kind of help you think about this. There is something in the chat though around the journey. Yeah. Um, I think Laura was saying um, what happens when your target audience may be in several different places in their journey at the same time. Um, I can imagine that happening. It doesn't seem like a single simple process from one end to the other. You know, you're right. Um, most people are probably in uh, adjacent spaces. They're probably not at the beginning, at the end. They're probably you know, kind of clustered, kind of aware and trial maybe around that area or maybe trial and decision or decision advocacy. Usually we see that clustered together a little bit more. Um, but, um, you know, you have to talk to them kind of in different ways, um, but talk to them in um, the place where you think you can make the most impact for them. So if they're in um, trial and decision, uh, maybe concentrate on the decision part of it um, to kind of um, cement them in that area as well. Yeah. Both of you mentioned metrics. And um, the, the challenge, though, is to try to understand what you should expect from your marketing efforts, right? So let's assume we're trying to generate more awareness. Nobody knows us, so we wanna generate more awareness. Okay, so we can spend some money taking out ads in various social media channels to try to help people understand that we exist. The question is, you know, what should we expect from that work? I guess the social media channels will tell us. They're going to let so many people see this ad. And from that, maybe some of them will actually understand what you actually wrote in the ad. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how do we assess, you know, what we're what we're doing here. Yeah, that's a good question, Art. Um, I think especially bridging um, digital marketing tactics, it's amazing how much you get kind of real time data and analytics back. So, you know, let's say, for instance, you know, you are like you mentioned a nonprofit in Phoenix. Number one, you can geo target Phoenix and say, I only want Phoenix. I only want, you know, people who are, you know, more you know, open to my type of organization and their pet enthusiasts and things of that nature. And so I want to target them with that message. 
then, you know, the algorithms and everything will start giving you feedback pretty quickly um, to say, you know, hey, this headline's working or, you know, people stayed on this for only, you know, two minutes. But this one that you did that had the video, they actually watched, you know, the full video. And so you'll be able to get some metrics back to say, hey, what's really resonating? Um, what's the level of engagement? And then you'll be able to tweak. Um, that's been the beauty over the last 10 years of digital marketing is it lets you be very much, you know, um, real time in terms of, you know, being able to adapt to um, some of the feedback and metrics that you're getting. Are we For all kind of you, spoiled? Are we all kind of spoiled with this idea of a viral advertisement or a viral post? You know, we all kind of are looking for the one thing we can do that really explodes on the scene. Is that realistic for people to think about, or is it really more, is marketing really more consistency and grinding it out and growing over time? I mean, I will jump in and say that, you know, from a true traditional brand marketer, building a brand takes time, period. Um, you know, you have to, number one, have clarity, consistency, um, conciseness of message before people are even able to, you know, re-articulate that back to you and then and hold it in their hearts and say, you know what, I love this brand. And now I'm going to tell someone about this brand and I'm going to share this brand with someone else. That doesn't necessarily happen overnight. So I do think this, you know, we've become kind of a, you know, microwave society used to be microwave society. Now it's an Insta society where it's just a click or a thumb, you know, away. So I think everyone loves this notion of going viral. But when you really talk about brand building, that just takes time. It takes time to form, um, you know, what your brand stands for in a person's mind, and then to seed your brand in a person's heart, and then to make your brand a part of their daily activity to say, hey, I want to go engage. I want to volunteer. I want to go to this fundraiser. So um, from my perspective as a brand marketer, it definitely takes a little bit more time. It's possible to go viral, but uh, you really want to continue to build your brand with your audience and grow from there. Yep. I think that's icing on the cake, the whole viralness of, of um, tactics like the ice bucket challenge. That's that's great. Uh, but what happens after that, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it's if you're a serial viralist, it becomes a little bit gimmicky. Um, uh -huh. And I think great brands do the foundational work and they put the hard work in to build that up um, and see it through. Um, so um, I think go back to basics and um, make sure you have a community, uh, make sure you have great content and make sure you're generating great results from the work that you do. You know, you can't have a great brand without, um, you know, those, those, those types of things. Um, at the end of the day, brand is an experience, brand is a state of mind. Um, and those things come from interaction, from engagement, from hearing things, knowing things. Um, and it's back to basics um, type marketing. Um, there was another question on the chat from, I'm sorry, I thought it was, uh, Laura is actually Luana. Uh, Luana, it was Luana. Luana. I, I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. Um, I think the other question from her was feedback, and I'm not sure whether she wants feedback on her question or I did put feedback as a channel from for one of my um, uh, uh, stages in the journey. Um, so if you're asking about what that means, um, don't underestimate the power of a great survey. Um, it doesn't cost you that much to launch one or to create one, and you can get so much information back. Um, it's also another way of engaging folks. Um, if you uh, write a good survey, um, people love to talk, people love to uh, tell you what they think. Um, and um, there's power uh, in engaging people that way as well. And then if you get great survey results, you can use it in your marketing as well right? X percentage of people said, blah, X percentage of people want to feel this way. And guess what? That's, 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 that's user generated content in a completely different way. <laughs> well, listen, and we're about to the end. And what I want to do right now is just let everyone know that we're planning an event next week called an intercession. And the intercessions are a little different than our webinars. Intercessions, you get to bring your real life problems and challenges that you're having with marketing in this particular subject to a, a web session like this where you can actually talk and learn from each other. So if you're trying to figure out how to make your social media go gangbusters, there may be another group on here that's doing some things that you can learn from or you can learn from Therese and, and Angela as well. So plan to join that. Um, I think it's going to be the same time, Julie, 
Julie, if she can hear Yes, me, that's correct. It's going to be the same time, three o'clock next Thursday. Yes. And we hope that you'll all join. But again, bring your problems, bring your real life organizational challenges and, and things that you've learned so that we can share them around and we can all learn from each other. So I hope you'll do that. Also, we're going to try to take an, a version of this and create a podcast from it. We'll have to see how we can slice and dice and make it, uh, make it work. But we're going to try to do that so it can be shared. One of the things I wanted to do with that is to help boards understand that money has to be spent on marketing. It is impossible for an organization to grow its brand long term without some money in its marketing budget. And I know for a lot of organizations, that challenge is huge to get, try to get the board to spend money on these kinds of things. But without it, you're not going to get anywhere. So um, that's, that's one thing. And to have realistic expectations about what you're going to get in the short run and what you hope to aspire to longer term. And remember, no matter where you are right now, the idea is to go from here to another place and to another place as, as, you, as time moves on. So that takes consistency. And finally, let me thank Angela Walton, um, who I met, I don't know, about it almost a year ago, it seems like, um, maybe a little less, at the Feedback Labs uh, Summit in Atlanta, and immediately was impressed enough to try to get her to do this session. And here we are. So I want to thank you for that. And Therese Kong, Therese Kong is our board member. She's a BBB Wise Giving Alliance board member. And believe me, we use her advice every single day in some way or another at the WGA. So uh, thank you, Therese, and uh, you're, you're just terrific. Um, and we want to, again, encourage all of you to participate as much as you can next week on the intercession which is really an interactive session. That's why we call it intercession, interactive. It's not me talking, it's not Angela or Therese talking, it's you talking. We're just sitting back having a conversation about marketing and what works and what's challenging and how we get, get past the challenges and how we take advantage of what's working. So thank you for joining and we'll see you back here next week.